We are activating your unique self-discovery one show at a time. The Orchard of Wisdom Self-Discovery Podcast are at your fingertips, just waiting to inspire and invite you in discovering just how awesome you really are and how to navigate through life in joy, enrichment, personal abundance, in mind, body, spirit, heart and soul. All the people we bring you are here to serve you on your journey of life. Do enjoy our next show. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Their Story Matters right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest today is Anne Howard. You would have listened to her before, just a few weeks ago, as Annika Savoy. That's her pen name for different books that she writes. And and, and Howard, she writes other books. In other words, she's writing an awful lot of books. And we covered a wonderful book that uh, that she wrote as Annika. And uh, in, in that book, we talked about the New York City lunatic asylum and the dangers of being a seer. I do invite you to go back and listen to that because we covered a great deal. And we can be extremely thankful that we're actually not living in that time period. And we think we have it hard, bad now. My goodness, you should have seen what went on back then. But now, today, we're going to be talking about what is happening in the Ukraine. She has a young lady living with her that is somebody who has escaped Ukraine. She escaped Mary, uh, Mary Lopol. I'm not sure. I'm probably not. Mary Upol. Mary Upol. And mm-hmm. in the Ukraine. And, uh, and Anne has written her story. Uh, you know, she was a, a young lady in Adrian Marek, a 31-year-old tattoo artist, who loved walking her dog by the seaside and meeting friends at cafes and public gardens. But all that changed on February 24th and 2022, when the Russian president Vladimir Putin launched his special military operations. She was forced to hide in filthy network of basements and underground tunnels and uh, for a month uh, under defying round the clock bombardment and huddled with little food or water, no heat, surrounded by groans from the sick and the smell of death. So she decided to escape. And this is her survivor story. And, you know, we we look at what's going on in the war right now, and it's like, it's been going on for a year, and then we've got this that goes on in politics, and this that's going on with the weather, and this that's going on with something else. And it kind of be, what is it still going on? Because we become numb. We become numb mm-hmm. to everything that's going on there. But we've got to remember that in Ukraine, as in Syria, as in Iraq, as in many, many places, there are wars going on. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and one thing we can really look at the Ukraine and we could look at their president and go, he's a true example of a leader. He's mm-hmm. a true example of an inspirer. And I think <clears throat> if it wasn't for him, Ukraine would have folded. He's an mm-hmm. inspirer for sure. But when people are displaced by whatever happens, you know, whether it's war or whether it's nature, you know, people get displaced. It's very, very hard for them to find their identity again in a new place because it's it's not something they've chosen. It's something that's been chosen for them. So honoring her with this book and her story and to let people know that like to moan that their coffee wasn't hot enough this morning at the barista (laughs) that there are a lot more things to complain about in life (laughs) so thank you for telling her story and welcome back Anne. thank you sarah it's a pleasure to be here with you so what did inspire you to write it um i think the story just fell into my lap to be honest, you know, writers, uh, I write nonfiction under the name Ann K. Howard, which is my actual name. And I write paranormal historical romance under Annika Savoy. So for my nonfiction, I just wait for the stories to come to me. Mm-hmm. And as a writer, you know, you sense when you have a good story that demands to be told. Yes. And this is what happened with uh, Escape from Mary Upol. Uh, I write in the introduction that I'm friends with a Ukrainian woman. I've been friends with her for almost 25 years now. And she moved to Florida uh, to marry a Ukrainian man. We initially got into contact about 25 years ago when I was looking for a nanny for my kids who were very young. And I was very busy, you know, building a law practice. Um, We connected with this young woman, Ina, at the time in Ukraine in Mariupol, 
Um, she was unable to get a work visa. So we ended up hiring a Polish nanny instead. But Ina and I continued to be in touch on a monthly basis for really the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And um, her little sister, who at that time was only 10 years old, Adoriana, uh, she would send me little drawings and little messages. And so that's how I came to know Adoriana, the author of this book, which I co-authored. I mm -hmm. told her story. Um, and so when the invasion began on February 24th uh, of 2022, I contacted Ina to say, you know, is Doriana all right? Is she out of Mariupol? Is she still in Mariupol? And Ina told me, we're, we're terrified. We don't know where she is. We have no phone connection. We don't know if she's still in the city. And as it turns out, Doriana was... Um, in the city of Mariupol, she was underground for five weeks in the center of the city, hiding from the 24-7 aerial bombing, the gun fighting in the streets. Uh, it, it was horrific. Uh, so when, <clears throat> when Adoriana finally let us know that she was okay, she was traveling through Poland on her way to the Czech Republic. And I emailed Adoriana in the Czech Republic, she was at a refugee hostel to say, you know, are you okay? Tell me about what happened. And she proceeded to just write email after email full of all of these bloody, grisly details of what she had endured. And she later told me it was kind of therapeutic mm -hmm. for her. And um, I couldn't help but see, wow, this story needs to be yes. conveyed to the world. We need to share this story. So I asked her, could we write this story together. And starting in late April of 2022, just a few months after she escaped uh, Mariupol, one month after, uh, we got to work on the book. She would send me the emails. <clears throat> I would translate the Russian that she wrote them in because in Mariupol, most Ukrainians spoke Russian. So she speaks both languages. And I would simply translate that using my app, whatever it is on Gmail and uh, do research on the side to kind of flesh out the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, we finished the book by the end of September. Mm -hmm. So the book really just took a few months to write, but it was a very exhausting summer for me, trying to get it all out there quickly. A question, does she still have the dog with her? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, Yola, my, my, uh, my, my brother is an author. And he always has a dog in the thing. And he said the hardest thing in the, in the storylines is keeping the dog alive. Oh, so, yeah. I, I completely agree that when we watch movies, mm -hmm. I, I horror movies, I'll say, yeah. don't kill the dog. Don't yeah, kill exactly. the dog. Exactly. You, you, you can slash and kill any person you want. <laughs> and I'm so desensitized. I'll be yeah. like, oh, whatever. But the dog, yes. no way. That's where exactly. I draw the line. Exactly. <laughs> But and Yola that, lives with us now, and oh, she's yeah. great friends with uh, our younger dog. They they play in the backyard all the time, and Wonderful. Yola is having the time of her life, actually, because we are in a husky paradise in <sighs> northwest Connecticut. We've got the mountains, the rivers. Mm -hmm. We have three acres of land. Mm -hmm. um, she has a fenced-in backyard. Um, we go for walks. Uh, she swims in the river. She's just having the time of her life. <laughs> compared to what she's been through. You know, um, yeah. you know, let's let's talk about the dog right now. I mean, we, we got a dog from the kennel mm -hmm. um, that while my, and this always seems to be when a dog comes to me, you know, mm -hmm. my brothers and sisters, mother and father are looking at these dogs and there's one that comes out of the corner and just comes crawling onto me, right? And that's how, you uh -huh. know, um, I didn't choose them, they chose me. Right. And then we, we later found out that she was petrified of bangs. And when a bang would happen, you would find her in the corner shivering. Or one time just before Christmas, she ran wow. away and she ran away to the Belgian consulate oh. and, and protected the consulate. And uh, uh, unfortunately, our, our doctor at the time went to the consulate and recognized her and brought her home. But oh, all over goodness. Christmas, we didn't have her. It was the most miserable Christmas out. Oh, yeah. When well, you're but, missing a dog, there's nothing like it's like you're missing, you know, exactly. a child. It's so terrifying to but know that. We don't out know there. what went on in the kennels for her to be so traumatized by a bang. And mm. you think little Yola has gone through boom, 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 ba, 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 all the time. Uh, I know, and, and I remember. Fear, you know, has to have had an impact on the dog, never mind the human. 
Yeah. The, the first uh, thunder and lightning storm we had mm. in Connecticut, you know, like we have really loud ones in the late summer, early fall. And poor Yola was hiding under the bed, just almost seizure like shaking because she was thinking that we were being bombed. And um, I write in the book, you know, the bombing, for the most part, it was the loudest in the worst, really from about four o'clock in the evening, 4 p.m. to uh, the break of dawn. That's when it was just relentless. But that's not to say that it didn't happen throughout the day because exactly. it did as well. And um, and I write that if you can imagine a fast moving train, freight train crashing into your house and then another one crashing into your par your neighbor's house, um, that's the level of volume that we're talking about. And the whole, she was, Adoriana was hiding alongside a, over a hundred other civilians in this basement. There was no heat. So it was February and March, mm -hmm. very cold. Um, there was very little food or water. They drained the water from the boilers. Um, they took dirty snow from outside and melted it. But even that was dangerous to just go up above. You yes. could easily get shot or shelled. So, um, yeah, Yola has has been through from hell and back. And so has Adoriana. Um, many people died in that shelter mm -hmm. and and they literally slept beside corpses yes. because they couldn't take these civilian bodies out to be buried. It was just too dangerous. So as the neighboring buildings around them were being bombed, civilians from those buildings would flee into the shelter with often lethal injuries. Mm. And Adoriana would treat these people. She would treat their wounds, you know, amputated limbs, um, you know, a lot of head traumas. Yes. Um, so it, it it was just hellish what, what they both endured for the first five weeks of the invasion. Which will be with them for life, you know. Um, yes. um, my mother and my father, of course, were in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know it had an effect on them. You know, yeah. I know that there were certain things that they would still jump at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my dad wouldn't talk about the war, you know, because it was British, stiff up a lip, move on. And But he died right. at 45, and I know a great deal of that, you know, yeah. due to bottling in. He was a squadron leader. And yes. so bottling it all in and all the bombing and the spies he had to get out and coming home with his tail on fire, you know, mm -hmm. it's a... Um, but just it was you didn't talk about it and you just got on with your life, which was the worst yeah. thing you can do. You know, since then, yeah. interview many veterans and they say, no, you know, we we must open up. But yes, they they live always in that reminder. It doesn't matter how good life is. There's mm -hmm. always this, but it can change on a dime. Yes. This, this is something we don't realize that people that go for well, well they're OK now. How what makes you think that that post-traumatic stress, those right. triggers their yes. life being taken away from them and yes. in a moment living through where well, uh -huh. am i going to get through the next moment never mind the next day yes and then afterwards survival guilt yes and uh, doriana has experienced all of those things you know and, and what i say at the end of the book is her story as dramatic and harrowing as it is is just one of millions of stories yes. of yes. ukrainians right now um, who are suffering emotionally, physically, uh, because of this insane war that Putin has has started, uh, totally unprovoked. But uh, I mean, we insane, to... insane is right because yes, there is no rationale man. there. It's pure I mean, ego. What human being with any level of conscience yeah. can see? the deaths of these mass graves and these civilians from bombing of apartment buildings, hospitals, schools, maternity hospitals, maternity. Yes. And, and can, 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 how can anyone watch that and know about that suffering and not have it weigh on their conscience, or which justify tells me, it. yes, justify it. Right. And also conceal it. The, yes. You know, the, they are great at that. Mm -hmm. um, but when my husband and I picked up Adoriana from uh, the airport in New York City, uh, LaGuardia, um, it was very interesting because all of the Ukrainians that were coming off of the plane were, for the most part, refugees. Mm -hmm. Many of them were from really 
highly stressful war-torn regions in the Donbass and Donetsk. And I, I, you could feel the stress as they came off the, you could feel how they, it was like they'd just been in a horror movie. Yes. You know, and I had these kind of ideas because Adoriana and I had gotten so close through our emails and our correspondence that I was prepared to give her a big hug, you know, but she has severe PTSD, obviously. So when she approached us, you know, I put out my arms and she pushed me away and turned and just started sobbing. Yeah. So I thought, wow, she is really fragile. Yeah. And, um, you know, when she first came, I, I noticed such high levels of panic and anxiety and sleeplessness, insomnia in her. Um, but she has really healed. You know, I, I really see her recovering from the war and she will never be the same again. That I, I think she will have nightmares of that for the rest of her life. Yeah. Um, you know, she came close to death on several occasions uh, when the auto shop, uh, auto parts shop above the building was bombed. All of the chemicals and fumes came into the basement yes. and they had to run out to the street in the middle of heavy bombing and gunfire in the streets and Russian soldiers uh, were shooting at the civilians, mm -hmm. knowing that those civilians were civilians. Yes. They were not, no, you know, no. this, they, this they were, was not, they not soldiers. No, no. And, and they, they had painted around the building, you know, civilians, uh, 117 people, they had painted it so they knew. And one time Russian soldiers even went down to the basement and marched through saying, we'll kill anyone if you're a soldier. And and here all these people are starving and they, they don't, don't have any water. Um, so that she ran up into the street and, uh, you know, that's the main thing she has nightmares about is um, running into that dark street where fire, I compare it to Dante's Inferno, you know, yeah. fire, all around them from all the surrounding buildings crashing to the ground bombs gunfire people screaming hysterically people dying um and and that's the main thing that she has nightmares about yeah yeah i mean i mean you know we we see in western society in western america you know people talk about their rights and their freedom taken away from them and all of that and it's like you've become very complacent with how easy you have it now yes, yes you know people do have difficulty we we do have people who go through mental and physical abuse we do go have people that are that are dealing with you know financial crisis we do have people with uh, that are you know facing their own suffering but mm -hmm. when you've got kind of mass of people coming together you know saying that rights have been taken away from them and they're victimized of it it's like mm, let's drop you in a war zone for a day I know. And, <laughs> and also, afterwards. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, I think also there's this concept of, well, you know, First Amendment freedoms mm -hmm. that we uh, enjoy and we've been almost spoiled by exactly. it where we just assume we can say and write what we want yeah. when we want. If I uh, disagree with any politician, so long as I don't say anything violent or threatening, I can say, ah, oh, that person, whatever. You, you need to understand that in Russia, in that Russian mindset, you cannot say anything. No. You're constantly guarding your words and your actions. And even if you're perfectly innocent, you can get thrown in a penal colony, you know? Yes. So we don't understand that paranoia mm -hmm. that Russians at large have because they are literally afraid of their government. Can you imagine being afraid of your government? And, right. and, 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 you know, I write about that in the introduction that it comes at a time when democracies throughout the world are in peril, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I think it's a combination of many things. Um, you know, just the turmoil of COVID and, the pandemic and climate change and all of these crises going on through our world. And sometimes people think, well, wouldn't it be safe to have a nice patriarchal autocratic leader who just takes care of everything? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a myth. 
That's a myth. a myth. Whenever you have that autocratic leader, it's going to lead to suppression, oppression. Mm. It's going to lead to potentially to imperialism, yes. which is what we see with Putin. I think I'll just take over that country. You know, it's yeah. like, can you imagine Canada? You know, we want you, the U.S.'s land and 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 money. We're we're just gonna invade March in America. There, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll invade New England to start off, and we'll illegally annex New England, and then we'll move down to uh, you know, the southern coast, and we'll you know, like I I think we don't realize in full how vulnerable we are as yeah. well. And by <laughs> Let me say, I'm not saying Canada will ever do that. No. <laughs> I'm married We're to a Canadian. We're too peaceful. <laughs> I love Canada. Let me just say that. I don't want it's all It's more these the people. other way around, actually. But, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. But, you know, we see it in American politics where, you know, um, election denying, you know, um, yes. that's something that Ukrainians have uh, dealt with since uh, the USSR fell in 1990, 91, with the fall of the Soviet Union, um, Ukraine and these other sovereignties suddenly became democracies. Mm -hmm. And it was very exciting to them. But you see all of the things we struggle with, they struggled with too. Uh, there was the Orange Revolution in 2004 and 2005, where the people of Ukraine were protesting, guess what? Russian interference in yes. their elections, yes. right? And <laughs> and government still going on. <laughs> and government corruption. Wow! Oh, where, wow! Where I heard that story before. Yeah. So, um, be and, a you know, theme around and, the world. <laughs> <laughs> we have to realize that we we are not immune to no. this type of attack in in this day and age, and we have to always be on guard, you know, and realize yes. when democracy is being threatened. Well, you know, every week um, I call home to England, my brother and sister, and and they're, they're kind of what I call, you know, misery moves because they watch all the news. And, and like I was saying to, to my brother the other day, because he was talking about like in Iraq, any woman that got divorced that now is non-involved and they're now considered property again. Uh, you've got Iran standing up for women. And, uh, of course, how many people have died in that protest? Yeah. Uh, of course, Russia, you know, there was a whole documentary on that of people who were trying to get the truth out there. And then mm -hmm. what would happen to them? You know, and, you know, Pakistan, you know, with what's going on Afghanistan there. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Uh, it just, yeah. you know, one thing after the other. And then anybody that speaks out, you know, is yeah. suppressed. But, you know, we talk about 1% or 2% in each country have the power and they right. have the money but it's like well what is the other 98 percent doing yes right and it's like well one of the things right. we've got to realize in life is that we're busy pointing a finger government 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 industry industry corporation da 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 da, da. we've given them that power yeah because we abstained from our own personal power Mm -hmm. and that if we step into our higher consciousness and empower mm -hmm. ourselves to live in a consciousness of kindness, caring, love and respect mm -hmm. and empathy and compassion, uh, we will be at a higher vibration that can't mm -hmm. knowingly hurt someone else to do so yeah. hurts ourselves. And right. if we realize that that actually is the answer, the more that we yeah. take accountability for our own inaction or action or contribution or lack of yeah. contribution, um, right. the more that we actually take that ownership and do something about it, the mm -hmm. more we actually become the global solution. Yes. And, and they lose and, their and power. At the simplest level, that contribution is voting. I mean, yes. everybody should vote. And it, 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 it distresses me when people say, oh, I never vote. I don't vote. You know, to it sound cliche, it sounds cliche, but you know, men and women died for your right to yes. vote, especially women, protect... especially women. How many years and did yes. it take to fight for that? Right. Well, yes. you know, in Ukraine right now, twenty five percent of the forces are are women, mm -hmm. and so you know, I'm on different Ukrainian um, sites on Twitter, and they post every day the the soldiers who have died mm. and also all the par many paramedics, a beautiful woman just died this week, a paramedic. Uh, and and it, it just breaks my heart that this younger generation of yes. Ukrainians that Adoriana 
the woman in my book who 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 underwent all of this, um, so many of her friends are fighting in Ukraine now, men and women, and or serving as paramedics. And to me, it's Ukraine's greatest generation. Yeah, I like agree. in America, they say the greatest generation was the World War II generation. Mm -hmm. These young Ukrainians, I look at them, some of them are younger than my children. Mm -hmm. And they, they are so brave. They are so courageous to sacrifice their life for their country. I mean, it, to me, it's just so inspiring because we live in an age where everyone says, ah, the younger generation. Yes. They're so selfish. They're so entitled. Well, I'll tell you, the younger generation of Ukraine is just beautiful. These are these are beautiful warriors. Because they've got a great leader. Yes. They've got a leader that isn't there about his insecurity or his ego. He's there for his people. He is not at all afraid or ashamed to beg other nations yes. to stand yes. with him, to stand yeah. up for the Ukrainian people. He understands about having to kind of promote the need. Don't don't yeah. forget us. I know it's a year. Don't forget yes. us. We still need yes. it. Do not uh, misunderstand if we go down. Then it's the rest of Europe they start ticking off. Absolutely. Right? And Absolutely. A, and, you know, he's not hiding in a basement somewhere. He's not hiding about they stole the election. He's not hiding about anything. Right. He's up front with yes. his people. In the right? streets of Kiev, yes. you know. Uh, and, you know, um, I think that also goes to the success of the military in Ukraine right now. I mean, I recently heard that for every seven Russian soldiers, one Ukrainian soldier is dying. So, I mean, it's it's a bloodbath over there and it breaks my heart, especially now in Bakhmut, what's happening. Um, they, they're they calling it a killing field. So both That's Russians okay. and Ukrainians are just being slaughtered in this, again, in this insane war. But what I love about Zelensky's military leadership is that in contrast to Putin, mm -hmm. who has to be in charge of everything, mm -hmm. right? Well, one person's not an expert on everything right. when it comes to war. And so he has to sign off on things before the ammunition is shipped, before they agree to proceed to the next city. They, he has to, and it becomes a big bureaucratic mess. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see online now. A lot of these Russian soldiers video, videoing themselves and saying, we only have shovels. You know, yes. we don't even have guns left. Yes. We don't have bulletproof vests. We, we, they're just sending us out here as cannon fodder. And um, in contrast, Zelensky delegates mm. all of the, the military decision making. He oversees but he gives, and, and and this is just based on the research I've done, and I try to stick to the most reputable sources possible. Yes. You know, um, the what, Washington no Post. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm sorry. And and I probably lost one third of my audience. But I, I, if, if my audience is listening to Fox News and that's the right. mainstream, believe me, they're not listening to us. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. 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 Then I'll go for it. Um, but yes, it's very important to cite your sources, which yes. I did in the book, um, you know, that I looked for a diverse um, group of sources rather than focusing on one. And I um, also tried to get some um, good international yeah. sources you know it's not just about what america is thinking exactly you know? <laughs> you know but there's something else you know there's i said that documentary i was watching of people trying to educate within russia the russians of what's going on but they're saying how they would take all the poor russians and make them into soldiers they're disposable right they wouldn't take yeah. somebody who was rich and put their son out there. Absolutely. Right. So it is. Ain't no senator's son. Isn't that the song uh, from the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, that, you know, they would take the African-Americans yes. uh, to die in Vietnam and, and protect uh, the, the, the or people would dodge the draft or whatever. Right. Exactly. Know. And yeah. the thing is, is that, um, you know, they've been sold a bill of goods. But, you know, as yeah. you said, they're over there with shovels and many of them have actually, you know, um, have said, I'm not going to fight anymore. I don't know what I'm fighting mm -hmm. for. Right. You know, killing women and children, bombing maternity mm -hmm. homes, schools, you know, uh, yeah. all of these type of places. Where's the honor in this war? Right. Where, you know, where is the decency? Yes. All we're doing is just one great big, huge massacre. 
and yes. and you don't care, Putin, if mm. I as a Russian die along with it as long as you win. And I think that the jadedness is beginning to set in. Yes. Right? And we're, we're yes. you know, we're, we're, when we look at it, I mean, they're saying that, you know, Russia is also kind of running out of funds a bit. Yes, because, you know, the top 1%, when Russia fell, they yeah. bought the Russia. oligarchs. Yep, they, they took off Russia. on their yachts. They <laughs> <Exactly>. went sailing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so. I, I know. I I had read about the um, the massive uh, exodus of not just the oligarchs, but the um, you know the the money makers yes. in Russian society, the highly educated and the liberal, if you want to call the, them that word. Uh, but they they have left, and as a result, the. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Do you hear the dogs? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I, we're well, just hey, going to have to. You're, you're telling my story, out. so no, no. It's, you're telling my story. I'm just going to have my input there. <laughs> <laughs> Yola is upstairs. Because and she's the door basement door is closed and my dogs are down here and Yola just started barking. So hopefully we'll just come here, girls. Come here. Come on, lie down and relax. Everybody relax. <laughs> so if you could find a way to edit that and no, 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 we again. keep it in. The dogs have got oh, an oh, opinion. You right? oh, of course. There's many a time that a dog either leaps on the lap or has a statement to make. You know, that we may not understand what their language is, but they've got an opinion and we should learn to listen. <laughs> well, they're certainly stressing me out with their opinion right now. Come here, girls. Come on, babies. Come here, dicks. Dixie, come here, I mean, girl. I'm, you know, the, the the fact that she actually went through all of that, you know, in the basement and struggling and living with a dog by her side. I know. You know, and now I, you that know, Yola is here with us, I mean, this is a very active dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, when she runs in the woods, she just runs like a deer galloping. She's beautiful, but she has a lot of energy. So to keep her, she had her hooked on a leash around her waist at all times because she didn't want to lose this dog in this war. It would be terrible. That, oh, I can't imagine how she'd feel if the dog was lost during that war. But, well, because um, that's her child. You know, anybody really who truly loves animals, they're, they're our children. They're oh, just absolutely. That's all. <laughs> absolutely. And now, you know, Yola is a is a therapy dog. She mm -hmm. got her certification and I can see how this dog really comforts her yes. because just knowing you and I went through that together. Yes. Nobody else went through it around me except you have that memory too. We're in it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a I've done a lot of shows on depression and it's something that I've mm -hmm. suffered from myself. And this thing of, I just snap out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just take this, you'll be fine. And it's mm -hmm. like people not understanding despair has its own signature. It has yeah. no reasoning. It has no rationale that mm -hmm. when it comes over and consumes you, it, mm -hmm. it takes that rationale along with it, right? There is no reason yeah. for it. So, you know, when people have that trigger or that post-traumatic stress or that memory of what has happened to them mm -hmm. there is no logic I'm safe now oh I don't need to worry about that they're back where they were in that moment in that despair in that am I going to make it in the next moment can I yes. save the person next to me and yeah. there is no unless you've been through it there is no measure for us to actually try and understand it all we've got to do mm -hmm. is just show some understanding and compassion Yes. And, you know, when you read about Holocaust victims yes. that survived, um, their children would say how difficult it could be to live with their parents who had gone through the Holocaust, because one common tendency would be being becoming almost like a control freak, mm -hmm. you know, because you were in a situation where you had no control exactly. and and now you're safe and you must maintain control. And if anything threatens your sense of control, you will become hyper vigilant and uh, over overreactive to fight try to get your control. Mode, right? Yes, yeah. fight yeah. or flight. And yeah. and I did find that when Adoriana came here, you know, she just wanted to get her own apartment and move to the city and take public transport like she used to in Ukraine and and have everything returned to the way it was. Well. I can tell you moving to an American city and getting a decent safe apartment 
on minimum wage right. with a dog. Yes. That's and and so it's been a process for us of saying to her, just rest. Yes. I know it's not easy to live with other people, mm -hmm. but my husband travels most of the time and I have a big house, three floors. And see us more as roommates. Yeah. Don't see you as mooching off these people right. and living in their house. Just see us. See, I share my house with you. You know, we're roommates. And take your time. So, you know, she's actually, we have enrolled her in the Northwest Community College um, nursing program. Mm -hmm. And that will begin in the fall, which works perfectly with her skills. Because mm -hmm. when she was underground, she had taken a Mal Maltese foundation course or something like that, like a Red Cross mm -hmm. paramedics course. So she used those skills underground uh, during the invasion. And so I think she'll be an excellent nurse. And, and then, you know, at some point she can get student housing and transition. But when she first came here, she wanted everything to go back to normal. And she had major culture shock, yes. major. Yes. I don't think we can understand. Mm hmm how different America is from Ukraine. Right. Um, everybody drives here. Everybody mm -hmm. lives far apart. No, you know, there's, unless you're in the city, there's no public transport in most right. places. And so um, I think she was kind of overwhelmed. And, and, and even that you can see how she's suddenly, she's starting to adapt. She's starting to adapt. Yeah. You know, if, we see far too much these days, you know, it, mm -hmm. like, we, we all go through struggles in life because that's part of our growth. That's part of how we learn um, mm -hmm. and how we become, mm -hmm. you know, the suffering is kind of optional to a point. Mm -hmm. Suffering can be bestowed upon us, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Circumstances can bestow that suffering, but the choice mm -hmm. to stay in suffering ultimately yeah. is up to us. And yes. at some point we have to look at it and go, do I want to constantly live in this suffering, mm -hmm. this fear zone anymore uh, that I can't right. take this anymore? I need to find a way out. Yeah. Uh, for some, unfortunately, it is suicide or drugs yeah. yes. or, you know, yeah. um, alcohol. But right. if, if they've got the right support around them, mm -hmm. the right example around them, then it's it is like, OK, no, I can do this. I've got people yes. at my back. I can go yeah. through this process and I can become a stronger, more enriched person right. because well, of the experience. Yeah. And that was a very important part of her story is that it the story is not just about human evil and what happened in Mariupol, the suffering that she saw, the Im immense uh, amount of death, yes. um, children. I mean, she saw a whole family in their car be blown up. A little oh. girl died. I mean, it was awful. But But we also focused in writing the book on not just the monsters, yeah. but the saints, yeah, right. the angels, yeah. you know? And, you know, she came to the conclusion in her email, one of the emails that she sent me towards the end is, in the end, love wins. I, yes. She said, yes. I believe yes. that love is the greatest power and it is only through love that this world is still in survival, that, that this world has not been destroyed. It is only through love and the best in humanity that preserves our life on this earth. And so you will find in reading the book, there are many people that come to her and she literally calls them angels. Mm -hmm. You know, the Ukrainian men in the shelter underground who would protect the civilians. He, they would run out and get food for them when they could. They would break up fights. You know, they would um, keep order in this chaos i mean these men were natural leaders yes that's what a leader does yes and and then when she went to russian occupied territory after escaping mariupol a kind ukrainian woman uh in nikolsky took her into her house and at that point adoriana looked like a homeless woman mm -hmm. she had not showered for over five weeks mm -hmm. she had not eaten a meal in over five weeks She'd lost 20 pounds. Her, she had not brushed her teeth or combed her hair yeah. or washed herself for five weeks. And her clothes, same clothes that she was wearing, just the clothes on her back. And this woman from Nikolsky took her in and just 
literally took care of her like a Florence Nightingale mm. because she was sick. She it was probably COVID that right. she had throughout the invasion. A lot of the people in the shelter were very sick and it was at the height of COVID in Ukraine exactly. with only 40 percent of Ukrainians vaccinated at that time. So um, this woman just comforted her and cared for her and also put her own life at risk yes. by taking her in. So there are people like this out there and, and it's because of them that I think the story ends on a note of truth, uh, a, a note of hope, of hope. Like, yes, all of this awful stuff happened, but love still has the power and you've got to believe in that and cling to that and hope someday that maybe you will do for someone what was done for you. Maybe you will take yeah. in, you know, the homeless, the refugee. Um, and something else I wanted to talk about was just the the aspect of being a refugee. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned how um, how hard it is to be driven out of your own country and have to go to other countries where you don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. You have no money. You're completely dependent on government benefits and the goodwill of the people of that country. Um, and just the culture shock. It I I can't imagine how I would do it. Can you, mm -hmm. where suddenly you have to get evacuate to, you know, Italy and learn Italian and yes. find a job and figure out a way to for afford an apartment. Um, this is a and, huge... and no time to even mourn what you've lost. Yes. Yes. And, and also that, that like we talked about it when she was in the refugee hostel, that a lot of the elderly people, those are the people that had the hardest time with it. Yes. Because, you, you know, as you get older, for me, I just, my comforts become more and more important to me, mm. you know. And we, we, just can't, we don't have that resilience. We and don't. This, we have an emotional resilience, a spiritual mm -hmm. resilience, but we don't mm -hmm. have that physical resilience anymore. Yes, that drive mm. to overcome. We're tired. And, the and energy or even the, the body itself to do it, right? <laughs> yes. Well, that's yeah. why you see on the news, you know, so many of these, you know, terrible, tragic images. You see these elderly people in these villages and, you know, they're hunched over and they're they're just exhausted. They look much older than their age. And and um, it's just too hard for them to adapt to to moving out. So they'd rather stay in their house under bombing in familiar territory with the people they know than get out. And, and it's sad, but, you know, the theory of evolution is is survival of the fittest doesn't mean physical fittest. No. It means the most adaptable. Exactly. And, you know, you see even in young children, you know, learning a new language. Mm -hmm. They learn it much quicker than an adult. Why? Because they're more adaptable. So Adoriana, when the invasion began, was 31 years old. And um, she's a smart girl. And she's uh, very adaptable. Mm -hmm. So that worked in her favor. Yeah. And she is a survivor. When I said it's a survivor's true story, she has all the makings of a survivor. But as we've been saying, survivors also have trauma from what they survived. And this is something we need to respect. And by you writing this story, you know, for people that have just watched CNN or Fox News or, you know, caught a glimpse of it on YouTube or Twitter or whatever the case is. And, oh, that mm -hmm. war's still going on. You know, yeah. it is for, for people who have stepped into their own opulence or mm -hmm. without kind of understanding the gift of what they have in true mm -hmm. freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. There is nobody here telling you that you're a woman so you can't vote or you you know, your divorce yeah. isn't valid because now you've got to go back to that beating husband. Yes, we mm -hmm. do have domestic abuse, but I'm talking about government uh, thing. I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the show, The Handmaiden's Tale. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> right. So with The Handmaiden's Tale, you know, when she wrote it, she said she has taken certain aspects of everything that is actually going on. And then yeah. kind of put it together in that tale. And we think, yeah. oh, no, that can never happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. have, you, have you been watching what's going on out there? Yes. You know, it's all happening the religious in people, games. this book's got to be banned. The LGB oh. or, uh, you know, of course, they're the favorite of, you know, transgender and the yeah. whole thing that's going on with that. And it's like they're try trying to turn the clock back to the dark ages yeah. because that's when they had power. And That's what they realize power. is they're losing their power because we are empowering yes. ourselves. Men, exactly. women, 
polka dot, it doesn't matter who you are. We are yes. stepping into ourselves yes. as beautiful human beings with a gift to share. And yes. we're, um, whatever package we're coming in, whatever mm -hmm. package we're coming in, uh, it is the essence of who you are, heart, soul, and spirit. Yes. Right, that governs the body. And for all of these people that are protesting so much, it's because they're so fearful. And this I, is, I this really, I, yeah, I liken it to, you know, a dog, uh, uh, um, um, what's it called? A dog, uh, you know, when they're rabid dog, yes. a rabid dog, yes. a rabid dog being caged in the corner. And mm. the more the rabid dog is pushed into the corner, the more aggressive they yes. become. And I, and I feel that's definitely what's happening in America now yeah. and uh, in other parts of the world too, yes. with white supremacy and um, this desire to go back to a country's state of mind that never really existed. You know, yeah, that's it was why all I think an illusion. You America know, was suppression. never great. No. I, America, the greatness of America is the evolution of America. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the constitution and, and, and the rule of law and how we've grown and how we've, you know, established civil rights and, you know, social programs to help the elderly, the abused. That is the great part of America. It is meant but to be the land of the free. Yes. And, and true freedom is yes. a responsibility of each and every one of us. Right. If we have the freedom to stand up and speak and be who mm -hmm. we are, mm -hmm. then there has to be some responsibility of who mm -hmm. we are to yes. each other. Right. You know, I'm glad you brought up the Handmaid's Tale because I did mention that she compared a, a Russian um, region that was taken over by Russia in 2014 and 15 as being, it was a particular city in the Eastern Donbass as being... Um, like Gil, is it Gideon or Gilead? Uh, uh, Gilead, Gilead, yes, Gil Gilead. Yeah. From the uh, where everything stopped when yes. the Russians took over, progress stopped, mm -hmm. and everything just became ugly. The learning institutions failed. Uh, prices rose. Mm -hmm. Inflation was high. There was no art. There was no culture. There were no different ethnic restaurants there, and that you know is what mainly through Zelensky's initiatives when he was elected, I think was something like 73% of the Ukrainian vote. That's what he did for Mariupol. Uh, his leadership brought a real European democratic flavor to Mariupol. So it was a really happening place. Yes. And uh, now, well, you just have to look at the drone footage now. Yeah. Um, it, it's just heartbreaking um, when when Adoriana went to New York City with me and she we went to Times Square and she was looking up at all the buildings and then we went to the top of the Empire State Building. She was looking at the panoramic view of New York City. And she said, she turned to me and said, why would anyone choose war over this? Right? I mean, why would Who anyone- Who do choose the war though? Let's look at the people that start the wars. Yes. Let's have a look at who they really are. Mm -hmm. Number one, they're generally very good speakers that can rile up other people mm -hmm. to make them right. sheeple. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. know how to put people around them that are sadistic mm -hmm. and that will do anything because they just want to kill, right? They want yeah. to maim. Uh, but they're generally people that have such inner insecurity. Mm -hmm. a child inside there that wasn't loved enough or a child that yeah. wasn't respected or valued enough and mm -hmm. nothing will a very narcissistic psychopathic yeah. and narcissistic yeah. and nothing will ever be enough for them because yeah. they're trying to fill a void that you cannot mm -hmm. fill from the outside you can only fill it from the inside yeah and so him wanting more of europe wanting to capture this more, more, more. He's just trying to fill that void within himself. Yes. But they yes. don't do the dirty work. They're very good at pointing and getting the people yes. around them that enjoy doing the dirty work. Yes, right. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> I, I I hear you. Yeah. But and I mean, would... we, we see that right now in America where it is the riling up and it's the riling up of the insecure man. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you know uh, these people are going to take this away from you and literally yeah. we've got what we call you know the white man syndrome right now the white people are going to be extinct 
right? right? But, but you right. didn't care when you were annihilating people of color than what you were right. doing to them. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, and it's not about the color of your skin. It's yeah. actually what color is your heart, your soul? Well, I think, you know, I think the fact that they feel threatened is in in a strange way logical because the whiteness yes. of the world yes. is changing. Yeah. You know, our, our adult son has been with, you know, a black woman, beautiful woman uh, for seven years now. Yeah. You know, I'll probably have mixed grandchildren yes. someday. Knock on wood. I hope so. But um, I have mixed children. My, my um, ex-husband well, is Chinese. So I'm half Chinese, half British. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And 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 all races will we'll yes. all blend because this is a global world and has yes. a technology just totally made that more possible and the ability to travel with ease. And so uh, I'm not threatened right. by, you know, having mixed grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, if you are threatened by having mixed race enter your family, then something's wrong. That's just something is wrong. You're not thinking about the spirit or identity of no. people. You're thinking about this physical encasement. Yes, which is and, just is just on loan to us. It's right. on loan to our heart, soul, and spirit to have this human existence, right? Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. it's this body is just a containment for you. And if you're living in the exterior of only the body and you haven't yeah. listened to the heart, the soul, and the spirit, you're not living. You're yes. living in fear all the time. Yes. You know, I um, I think you realize that even more so as you age. Yes. You know, I'll look at pictures of myself when I was a teenager or in my 20s or in my 30s and 40s. I think, oh, damn, I'm getting old. <laughs> I don't look <laughs> like that no more. I mean, you know, the rose uh, is kind me? of... <laughs> all the gray silver hair I have on my head. <laughs> I know, the wrinkles and, and just... You know, um, and, and you hear a lot of times older women will say, you know, especially middle-aged women, I just, I feel invisible. I stop being seen. Nobody notices me anymore because of my looks. And I think it's actually kind of liberating to age. Yeah. Because, you know, you just, you're known for who you are. And thank you. It, yes. Yes. It's, it's I not, mean, not the body is a huge anymore. distraction. Yes. 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 I mean, you know, um, I've done quite a number of shows on that because, you know, age thing is ageism. Yeah. And and you look at Helen Murin and you look at Judy Dench and you look at Maggie Smith mm -hmm. and you look at many yeah. others and they will show themselves without makeup. You know, yeah. uh, Helen Murin showed this is me before the Oscar party and then this is me afterwards, right? That That takes balls. It does. Um, and, and, but but it, know, it's the, like, the, it's the essence of who they are that is so yes. beautiful. And, and yes. a quick bit on that is I interviewed a beautiful young woman called Keshi, who is um, a burn victim, 65% uh, mm. over her body. And I'd interviewed her. And then a few months later, I see her on America's Got Talent. And she uh, clearly disfigured because literally 65% of her body. And she sang and she won the hearts of people because people mm -hmm. could feel you know, all of her strife, all of her suffering, all of her everything had ignited this voice within her that was so transcending. Yes. Nobody saw the exterior of her anymore. They, right. they felt the interior of her. Yes. And then I interviewed her along with a veteran who had been blown up and his richly right, burnt right down to his skin. Yeah. And people have said, listening to their show, they cried, not because they felt sorry for him, that right. they were so inspired by the way they look yeah. at life and the way they live yeah. life and you know there's so yeah. much to learn from these people that mm -hmm. instead of going you know oh i have a ring of botox you know <laughs> it's like yeah. i have a wrinkle i earned it <laughs> yes absolutely and and you know men in hollywood haven't struggled as no. nearly as much as no. the women with that as men get yeah. older they look more distinguished yes. and i mean but sexier, women sexier. yes <laughs> because our faces are smooth and we tend to show it uh more we we violate those principles of beautiful fresh you know 20 year old faces and uh we become we look different and it's not a bad thing no it's not and i think thing. this is actually Great. one of the one of the problems of north america mm -hmm. is that we have spent so much emphasis on the exterior 
you not only the way you look, how many followers do you have? What's your car? What are you wearing? Who do you associate mm -hmm. with? That mm -hmm. we've forgotten about the investment on the interior. Yeah. You know, where is our heart? Where is our soul? Where is our spirit? Where is our purpose? Right. What's our contribution from the inside out? And yes. you can look at people like Keshi or like other people who on the outside would quote, quote, not be considered beautiful, but they have such mm -hmm. a beautiful soul and beautiful essence yes. that you just, you just want to be around them because they yes. fulfill you. And I think right. this is something that we need to look at. The ego or the insecurity of the ego mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. actually what does cause the wars, what does cause the, yes. dis, uh, the disruption, does cause the, uh, the, dis, the unrest. And we have to really look at it and go, why am I feeling so insecure? What have I been mm -hmm. buying Right. That makes me feel so insecure that I don't yeah. feel enough. That is your inside journey that you have to make. There we go. Whoops. See, there was an agreeance. <laughs> Just be your husky uh, you. Yeah, someone, someone's coming down. I don't know. Uh, Dixie, come here, girl. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Um, I I also, I love the book, A Course in Miracles. Have you yes. ever read Miracles? Yeah. So you know, the basic premise is that there are two emotions or two things that drive us, love or fear. Yeah. And which one are you, you know, feeding? Fear <laughs> comes from the ego. Yes. Love comes from uh, the energy surround us, surrounding us and within, within us. us. This mm. is love. This is healing. This leads to beauty and, 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 and healthy human relations and then fear comes from the ego and everything that comes from that turns, turns to crap. <laughs> you know nasty. what I mean? It's, it's it nasty. nasty. All the things and, that we do to other human beings is mm -hmm. coming from your own fear or ego or ignorance or arrogance. Right. right. And you know, that's another good thing about the aging process yes. is that you, you're able to look back on things you did or said in your younger years, and see your ego. Oh, my husband has a meeting. I have right to go. now. But we know. Yes, we're going to round this up. Okay, my love. How do people get the book? And of course, okay. uh, on the show page, please go to the show page, folks, because there is another book there that she's not going to talk about anymore. But the whole documentary on the book is there, um, ah, and of course, all of her other books are there as well. Please go and look at them. But how do people find your books? How do people find you? Okay, um, ankhowardauthor.com, okay? That site is for my nonfiction books. You also see in that site a book I wrote about a real-life serial killer that I got to know. Yes. Um, you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, I think you put my Twitter uh, handle there, did you? Mm -hmm. I, yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Facebook. So look me up, Ann K. Howard Author. And uh, the book is available at all major outlets. Um, I would, uh, well, Amazon's great. Get it on Amazon or go to your local bookseller. If they don't have it on the shelf, ask them to order it. Uh, the audiobook I just listened to, it's it's fabulous. I highly recommend the audiobook. And I will just say really quickly that it just won the Independent Press, uh, Independent Book Award. Wonderful. Independent Book Award um for in the category of social and cultural issues so i think you'll agree if you look at the amazon reviews that is pretty well written and it's just a, an important story it's a very important story um one canadian reviewer said read period this period book period <laughs> exactly and that's how i feel read the book it's a very important book to read yeah. Exactly. And the thing is, it's not just, you know, you've taken snippets and put something together. You are telling someone's story. You're telling her story from her lips, yes, from her experience. And it is a reminder for everyone out there. Like, I mean, this is a book that should be read by teenagers um, who are trying to understand what's going on in the world um, yeah. or just how lucky they really are to have yes. the freedom they have, but also to understand how to be more compassionate with people 
uh, in, in that whether this is her struggle, but so many other people even in, in your own land are going through things. And when you learn to look at that, you learn to be more compassionate, empathic and uh, empathize and, and just help. Step up and help. Do something, right? Amen to that. Always Amen wonderful that. having you here. You got nice to come back with your next Sarah. book. Okay. Bye bye. Till next time, folks. Remember, get the book. Read the, all of the information on the other book on the serial killer. Uh, look at the other book under Anne uh, Annika Savoy. Uh, listen to that show as well. There's so much information here for you. Until next time. Bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Find all of our shows on selfdiscoverymedia.com under podcasts or selfdiscoverymedia slash shows. And for all our current shows, go to What's New. We are supported by you, the audience. You will see a nice big shiny blue button for one-time donations or follow us on Patreon and you will be able to support us there. We enjoy bringing you such wisdom. And the next show will be up in just a moment.